You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 19. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Chris Sims. On today's show, we interview Bernard Means, the director of the Virtual Curation Laboratory at Virginia Commonwealth University. We're going to talk about 3D printing and scanning and the pluses and minuses for use in archaeology. Let's get to it. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today, as always, is my co-host, Chris Sims. Hi. Let's get right to the show and introduce Bernard Means. Bernard, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm an uh, archaeology professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and in addition to teaching archaeology classes, I also run the Virtual Creation Laboratory, which focuses on 3D scanning and 3D printing of artifacts and other things from all over the world. All right. Hey, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about how you got into 3D scanning and printing? Because um, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you not start that department there? Like what got you interested in this? Um, I did, in fact, start uh, the uh, Virtual Creation Laboratory um, about four years ago. Actually, a little bit more than four years ago, I was contacted by John Haynes, who was the archaeologist for the Marine Corps uh, base at Quantico at the time. And he had an idea about uh, getting some 3D scanning equipment to scan uh, some projectile points. And he's a VCU alumnus, and we've known each other for years, and he's, so he wanted to do the project with me um, because I, uh, um, I, I'm heavily engaged with my students, and I take them to conferences and stuff. And so he wanted to do something that would uh, have a good student input. Um, and so we uh, got together, and we sort of noodled through the project and uh, started 3D scanning projectile points. And we realized pretty quickly that uh, 3D scanning technology, certainly at the time, uh, wasn't going to be able to be useful for mass analysis of points, which is kind of what John wanted to do. Uh, but it is useful for doing things like building a digital type collection, which is actually one of the things I'm working on uh, right now. Um, and so, so basically, we started sort of you know 3D scanning, and I was very enthusiastic about the technology, and I started showing it to my students, and they were not, um, because the digital models I showed them were not nearly as interesting as any of the video games that they could be playing on their computers. <laughs> uh, but they were interested in actually seeing replicas of things. And so we started 3D printing uh, things so I could use those in my classes. It was actually a lot easier for the students than seeing it on their computer. And we started doing things like uh, a lot of public outreach. And it's it's great to take plastic things. So you don't have to worry about them. And then we've also uh, lately have gone into making exhibits uh, using 3D printed artifacts. So sort of that's basically sort of how it all sort of snowballed. Okay, well, you know, I want to ask you about 3D scanners and and kind of what to use and and some stuff that you guys are using. But in the process of doing that, maybe we can ask you another question. You can talk about that. So I, I had a question from Facebook that was, um, how much detail can you get in, say, a projectile point from a typical 3D scan? Do you need like a really high-end 3D scanner to get really precise detail on, say, flake scars and stuff like that? Um, is it accurate for millimeter measurements and things? Um, yeah, so you would need probably um, the cheapest scanner that's high resolution that's out there right now um, is, well, there's a number of scanners out there, but the one we use primarily is the NextInja desktop scanner, and that runs about $3,000 for the scanner itself, um, and that'll give you the resolution that you want, um, and, and, but there's other costs as well, so you, know, you need a computer that's certainly sufficient to process it. And there's a so-called optional software that if you don't get it, you won't get the resolution that you want. Um, there are more expensive scanners. I actually uh, got a demonstration of a scanner today that uh, is uh, easier to use than the next engine. The next engine is, is mostly a desktop scanner, and this is a handheld scanner. Um, but it, it 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 retailed for thirty thousand dollars, so that's certainly a big leap in yeah. cost. Yeah. There are cheaper scanners that are out there. Um, you can get one for about four or five hundred dollars that you can, you know, clip to your iPad if you have an iPad, or one that you can plug into a USB port on a computer. But those are sort of a, the resolution; they'll get a good shot of your head, and not much better than that. <laughs> um, so they're really designed for sort of like you know scanning people, and not scanning uh, anything but large objects. Large, um, large, large squishy objects. Uh, they don't have to be squishy. You can have, we've scanned features actually with the cheap scanners, mm -hmm. um, and they don't have the you know really really detailed resolution. But you can actually make good measurements from them, and you can even uh, take a feature and and slice it and make a profile that you could stick in a report 
um, a lot fast. Well, certainly faster than I could draw it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's photogrammetry, which I haven't really done much of. So uh, that's more of a software solution. You can take a lot of photographs um, and uh, um, get a get a get a pretty accurate model. Steve Davis, who's at the Research Laboratories of Archaeology at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, has uh, been getting into that. And he actually has a there's a website called Sketchfab, and if you uh, uh, search the Research Laboratories of Archaeology, you'll see some of his digital models up there. All right, cool. Um, well, you know, I'm wondering, you know, we're both Chris and I are both uh, CRM archaeologists, and I think one of the dreams for this, for me anyway, is, you know, when we're out in the field and we find a diagnostic projectile point, um, typically we'll either collect it if it's if it's in an area where we're allowed to collect. Um, or we will just take photographs of it and, and, or sketch it. Some people still sketch them, um, but take high resolution photographs of it. And then that'll be it. It, it stays out in the field. What, what do you think the time frame is? Uh, how close are we to being able to scan this in the field quickly and efficiently, maybe store that in the field and then bring that scan back to the office and print out that projectile point? Well, if you do, if you use photogrammetry, you could do that now. Mm -hmm. Um, so you'd have to get the software, um, which, um, varies in price. Like I think Agisoft uh, commercially is $3,500. So the software is not cheap, but then you can use any, you know, digital camera. So you could take enough pictures from enough angles um, in the field. And then it uh, doesn't take that long if you have the right computer to process. And then printing is once you have the digital model, um, a projectile point usually takes uh, maybe half an hour to print, to mm -hmm. print a replica. Um, and one of the things we're toying with is um, actually creating 3D printed type collections that people could take into the field with them. So if you're working on a project, um, you could actually download, well, we're going to upload our models. Uh, you could actually download them, print them, and take them in the field and use them for identification. Or you can use a digital model if you, if you prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our readers submitted a question that you might have a good answer for. How is a 3D scan better than a nice clear photo and a few instruments? A few measurements. Measurements, sorry. Well, what a 3D scan, well, one thing a 3D scan does is it allows you to share that, that model in a way you can't do with a photograph. So if you, if you take a photograph and you take a bunch of measurements, there's always gonna be some sort of observer bias. Um, and, and people are not necessarily gonna agree on what needs to be measured. Uh, but if you have a 3D digital model, I can right now, and, and, and in fact, we, we we just finished doing this for a report we're working on uh, that hopefully go public in January. Um, but we can embed a 3D model into an Adobe Acrobat file that anybody with an Adobe Acrobat reader uh, seven and above can open it up and they can manipulate and they can they can choose what view they want of that object. They don't have to depend on a static photograph. And within the, uh, the Adobe uh, um, uh, Acrobat file, you can actually make measurements uh, of that digital model. Um, so, um, so it's certainly something you couldn't do with a, with a static illustration necessarily to get a, a different kind of measurement than you might want. That's a great answer too. All right, we got another question here about uh, it, this. All comes down to resolution. I think that's what people are really concerned with. So sure, I think, sure. I, yeah, I think I know the answer to this question. But is it is it possible to scan and then print, say, um, you know, broken pieces of pottery and then refit them, refit the scans back together with any amount of accuracy? Oh yeah, you can do that. In fact, you can actually do it. We've done it two ways. We've three uh, D printed the shards and then glued them together. But you can actually take the individual shards and digitally put them together and then print it as one piece. Wow. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little bit uh, um, sounder. Or uh, another thing that you can do, uh, say you have a vessel where you're missing a, a key piece, um, you could actually sort of digitally model that piece and print it uh, if you're doing a reconstruction and you can use the printed piece to give you the support that you need. So yeah, you can, that is easy. That's actually relatively easy to do um, <laughs> with uh, uh, 3D printing technology. In fact, there's a, there are, we, we usually print plastic because it's cheap and, and, and that's what we have. But there are uh, 3D printers out there that'll print in a uh, um, uh, clay-like material. Um, so you'd actually get the, the sort of the look and the feel of ceramics. Clay-like material? That sounds something that the government designed. <laughs> it's some <laughs> sort of powder that's impregnated with a, uh, an epoxy to hold it together. Oh, okay. So it, it kind of looks and feels like, uh, but it's not quite play um but it wouldn't surprise me if at some point in time i mean they are people are actually 3d printing buildings uh with concrete so hmm. uh, technology doesn't seem to be that far away 
So if I'm just to, to go back a second, if let's say a CRM firm wanted to get into 3D scanning in the field, maybe they're doing photogrammetry to make it easy. Um, but really the, the 3D printing when they get back uh, in the office. So they would probably need that $3,000-ish device to get some halfway decent resolution. Um, you can actually uh, um, get a uh, printer for about um, $1,500. That'll give you pretty good resolution. Okay. Um, you'll still see um, you'll still see lines um, from the printings. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's it's not that noticeable. And there's actually some plastics you can print in that you can sort of basically brush them with acetone. It takes care of those lines. But mm -hmm. um, you can you can uh, I have a printer that does. Uh, uh, um, like a, um, it's, it's 0 0.1, um, 0 0.1 millimeter accuracy. So it's not bad. Wow. That is pretty good. Um, yeah, I know we don't measure that accurate in the, in the field. I, you can print it and you can make a, a, a measurement that's going to be, uh, even with the, uh, um, uh, the, the slightly more inexpensive printers, uh, uh the 14, $1,500 printers, um, your measurements aren't going to be that far off. Yeah. And the nice thing about the digital models, once you create the digital model, maybe you don't have the printer today that could print it, mm -hmm. uh, but you will in the future. Um, and there are, there are service bureaus that will print for you, hmm. uh, for a cost, of course. Yeah, I've seen at uh, some FedEx Kinko offices, they can 3D print for you. I think uh, the goal, and Staples is, is getting into the 3D printing as well. Uh, but there's a company called uh, Shapeways uh, where you can send them a digital model. And they'll print it. I mean, if you want a steel projectile point or a gold one, they'll make it for you. Wow, that's pretty cool. And, you know, I just want to clarify for some people that may not have seen a 3D printed object. Um, and if you haven't, just find Bernard at a conference and he's got a pocket full of them. So, um, but anyway, uh, I've got a couple of um, 3D printed projectile points from you and, you know, just in case people don't know this, a 3D printed object is actually, I mean, I think the easiest way to explain it is it's a whole stack of 2D, um, 2D layers, basically, just on top of each other. And that's how it prints it, a layer at a time to create that 3D object. And then you get those lines that Bernard is talking about um, on the object. Yeah, and there are printers that, um, they're actually coming down in price that are resin-based printers, and they okay. use a laser to fix a gel, and those won't have the lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now... Um, you, you can only print basically small things at, 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 at the price point that archaeologists are comfortable with. Right. Hey, what do you think? I, I think I saw you comment on this on Facebook a few months ago when I first saw it. What do you think about that super fast um, liquid 3D printing thing where the object was pulled basically up out of a liquid and it was a fully farmed object that was completely smooth? You remember that? Yeah, yeah. And um, um, that's for uh, everyday use. That's probably minimally five years away. Right. Uh, but the resin-based printers I was talking about kind of work that way. Okay. Um, but not at the speed and the accuracy of that. Uh, so I think it was MIT that, that had that printer. All right. So uh, I think what it, one of the things I was thinking about is, um, uh, well, actually, before we get into that, what kind of other project? You mentioned doing um, like a project, projectile point typology um, library that you guys are creating. Um, I assume that's based around the Virginia East Coast area first, and then you're kind of branching out from there. What what kind of volume and depth are you going to have on that? Um, well, right now we have 81 points that are in the, the appendix for the report, and we're adding more. Mm -hmm. um, the points are actually um, from um, a number of sources. Uh, I actually went down to uh, North Carolina and scanned some of the projectile points that were used by Joffrey Coe um, that, that uh, became sort of the North Carolina typology. And I went up to New York and scanned points uh, that William Ritchie used in creating his typology. Uh, and then I uh, scanned points uh, uh, primarily from Virginia and uh, Pennsylvania, where I do a lot of research uh, from different sites, different time periods. Um, so I think we have over, um, I think we have a couple of hundred projectile points um, not all of which have been, uh, some of them aren't identified. Uh, so that's the, uh, the step that we need to go through. Or there's sort of, uh, one site had, I think something like 25, uh, uh, bifurcate points. Um, and sort Whoa. of, you know, yeah, from one side, it was amazing. Um, um, and so that's, the, so that's one thing we're working. We're also working on, uh, um, an animal bone typology, 
Um, so we're trying to get sort of common animals and also uh, extinct animals, things like the passenger pigeon, which uh, most people actually probably have in their archaeological collections because there were so there were billions of them at one point in time. Right. Um, and so you're probably going to have it, but you're not going to know it because people build their typologies based on uh, living species. Oh, well, I mean, recently living species. Um, and things like the passenger pigeon, people don't have the bones and they won't get access to the bones. So by 3D scanning them and then 3D printing them, uh, they'll have the access. And, and for bones in particular, it's actually 3D printing is key uh, because it's not just the sort of the shape and the morphology so much. It's, it's the actual size of the elements. And that's kind of hard to get across digitally. Even if you have a, a scale on a, on a digital illustration, it's, it's kind of still kind of hard to sort of uh, do that. But if you can hold a, a printed replica against the mm -hmm. real thing, that's very handy. Nice. With the uh, animal bones, are you encountering any resolution issues where maybe the size of the bone or certain elements or features are uh, unable to be scanned? Or is it is it pretty good? Are you able to study that? Oh, no, we have all kinds of problems. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, bones that are, the fresher bones are actually a little bit hard to scan. So we usually have to sort of coat them with a little bit of a powder. Um, uh, so they're um, not quite so reflective, but things that are really thin and small are challenging. So one of the things that we were working on trying to 3D scan with the laser scanner was a, 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 a fish called a hairlip sucker, which went extinct in the late 18th, early 19th, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And we only were able to successfully scan two of the bones uh, out of the two dozen we had. And that's one where I'm actually going to try photogrammetry on um, and hope that I can get some, some better results. Uh, um, but the, the, laser sc the, the laser scanner that we use basically has four lasers that move across an object and they're uh, very thin lasers. And so if you have an object that's very thin, uh, are very reflective. It's it's very challenging to sort of get that object. Um, it's also challenging to 3D scan complicated shapes like a skull. Um, you can't quite get all of the skull with the laser scanner. Mm -hmm. And if you the parts you don't get, the software likes to fill in the holes. Um, and so you'll get something that has the sort of the basic morphology, but you might be missing some of those key features. And and in that particular case, what people um, often do it to get around that problem is actually to uh, do CT scans. Wow. Um, then you get that you get that really in-depth uh, internal morphology as well. Now, once you scan the object, like let's say a skull, for example, um, can you go in and before that's printed, can you go in and manipulate the scan to maybe fix any errors or, or even add some, uh, I don't know if it's even possible to add like some photogrammetry images over the top of that scan to fill in some holes, you know what I mean? You could. You can actually, uh, um, yeah. So if you have a, once you have a digital model, you can have digital models from different sources and bring them together. So, for example, um, I recently 3D scanned a 95-year-old World War II veteran uh, <laughs> with a with a with a handheld scanner. Nice. And I needed to scan him sitting down because uh, during during World War II, his plane was hit over Italy, and he climbed out of the back of the plane and sat on the tail, and then he parachuted. Uh, from the tail. From the, and so uh, the Virginia War Memorial, where he's 96, he volunteers at the Virginia War Memorial every week. Um, they actually got a model of his plane that I think has like a eight foot wingspan that mm. they have hanging in their great hall. Wow. And so they wanted to have a scaled down model of him sitting on the plane. And so we, we 3D scanned him, but the scanner that I used has a, a resolution that's very good for heads and a lower resolution for the body. So I scanned the body and then I took the head scan and uh, uh, replaced the head from the, the lower resolution scan. So hmm. that's actually relatively uh, straightforward to do. And there's, there's free software out there that you can use uh, to do it. Nice. Well, we're gonna take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. We've got a lot more questions for you, Bernard. Great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Chris Webster here from the Archaeology Podcast Network, and we're giving away an iPad Mini 4 to one of our listeners. The iPad Mini 4 came out in September. It's a 16 gigabyte space gray iPad with AT&T cellular ready antenna. All that means is it comes with a GPS. You do not need to get a data plan. And you don't even need to be on AT&T if you never get a plan to get a data plan. It just has GPS. 
It also has a fingerprint sensor and Apple Pay Ready and all the good perks that come with that. So it's a good iPad, we use them in the field. There are two easy ways to enter. One, do a Profiles and CRM interview before December 15th, 2015, or recommend someone for an interview. You'll both get an entry once the interview is posted. If you want to know more about Profiles and CRM, go to www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash profiles. All the questions are listed right there. The other way to enter is to like the APN Facebook page and share it with your friends on Facebook to get the word out about our awesome podcasts. The winner will be announced December 16th, 2015 at 4 p.m. Pacific time. So Get your entries in, send me those emails for people that want to do the Profiles in Syrian podcast, and good luck to everyone. Hi, Mac. Take us out with a binary solo. All right, we're back, and I've got what I think I know is probably the answer to this question because um, because Bernard, you're you're very prolific on um, Instagram, and I, I get to see a lot of stuff and, and live vicariously through the VCL <laughs> with uh, watching your Instagram feed. It's pretty amazing, actually. Um, but what is one of the most unique or interesting things you've had to scan? You've been asked to scan because the VCL gets asked to scan other stuff besides archaeological items, right? Yeah, they do. Um, and in fact, I actually have a scanning project coming up. Um, on Thursday, um, I've been asked to scan the world's oldest documented ham and the world's oldest documented peanut. <laughs> uh, wow, that beats what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> so, so that's probably going to be the most one of the more unusual things that I've done. Nice, nice. Because the, the thing I was thinking about was the uh, the um, what was it the shuttle bracket or something like that for NASA. Oh yeah, so I I, I 3D scanned three brackets from the space shuttle Discovery. Um, so a friend of mine is a conservator that works for uh, Air and Space Museum, and uh, there's a museum in California, the California Museum of Discovery, that's going to, uh, it's probably already done it actually, put a space shuttle on display, and they wanted to put it on display uh, um, sort of uh, um, with the nose pointing straight up, and they needed some brackets, and they couldn't, and they don't make space shuttle brackets anymore. Uh, and so they pulled some of the brackets out of the space shuttle discovery that they have uh, at the Smithsonian, and they asked me to uh, uh, to uh, scan that. I think I called the blog post uh, in space. No one can hear you scan. <laughs> uh, nice. And so we scanned the three brackets, and uh, and then I didn't hear anything from the folks in California. So I contacted them, and and they go, and they said, oh yeah, you know, we went to uh, Houston, and we were kind of walking around, and we found a big pile of them. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, get out. So, uh, so they didn't need our brackets. Uh, so, uh, but I do have, I do have the space shuttle bracket. Something tells me if they walked around enough, they'd find another space shuttle too. So probably, you know. I think they, I think uh, NASA was known uh, uh, overproducing. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. All right. So I've got a question I was thinking about. I was telling some people about um, this interview coming up here over the, the Thanksgiving holiday and you know, I've encountered before, usually um, this is over in like Africa and some other places, but there are some places where um, if you say take a photograph of a person, like a native person, um, they don't like their picture taken because they feel like their soul or their essence is taken, you know, when you is, is stolen when you take the photograph. Have you encountered that with 3D scanned artifacts um, in any native societies? Like who owns, have you, have you encountered ownership issues with the 3D scan and the replicated artifact? Uh, definitely. I've actually scanned some stuff that I can't do anything with. Okay. Um, and, and actually, uh, um, Zach Selden, who works for the uh, Center for Heritage and Regional History at uh, Stephen F. Austin uh, State University, I think is what it is, in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, he actually works with the Caddo Nation, and the Caddo Nation um, has certain restrictions on. They allow 3D scanning, and you can depict 3D models as long as you remove the color. Oh. So that's sort of the restriction. But other groups um, don't allow you to show the 3D scans at all. Um, probably one of the more interesting ones, uh, uh, dealing with sort of natives that I've heard of, the Smithsonian Institution has a Tlingit mask uh, um, in their collections, or had in their collections, but under NAGPRA they returned it. But the Tlingit that allowed the Smithsonian to make a 3D scan of it, a very accurate 3D scan, an accurate 3D print. And they treat the 3D print as if it has um, uh, uh, so its own essence as well. And so, so I think every year 
they actually do ceremonies involving the 3D printed mask like they would do with the real thing. Wow. And then they return to the 3D printed mask for the Smithsonian to have on display. Wow. That's crazy. That That's pretty cool. I, I kind of expected that. Yeah. But yeah. Interesting. Um, I, I wonder if we'd encounter anything like that with some of our CRM projects. Um, I, I don't know, because we don't encounter usually any problems with just taking photographs and stuff like that. So I don't know if you 3D scan and then and then 3D print if there's a, an issue there. Like, you know, if some people don't mind a scan, but if you print it, that's, you know, a no-no. Well, and, and, and that's actually an interesting question. And so um, in the in the sort of the sort of the heritage museum uh, trade, and I think in art museums as well, there's a lot of concern over um, 3D scanning because they say that we're probably within three, uh, uh, five years on the outside, every smartphone is going to come with a pretty decent 3D scanner built in. Right. Um, and so even right now, you can go and 3D scan a work of art. And so some of the sort of museums are kind of worried about that. Uh, they're worried about uh, um, how people might manipulate uh, and maybe in inappropriate fashions some of their <laughs> works of art. They're, I mean, I, I made a half gorilla, half octopus, so I'm not one to talk. Um, hey, you put Venus on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, the Venus Willendorf on a bicycle. Well, yeah, that has its own story. That's actually uh, an art project by a student, the Venus. Uh, she sculpted it out of chocolate. Um, because the Venus of Willendorf is supposed to be a, um, a fertility figurine. Right. Uh, but with hers, hers, she mixed crushed birth control pills into it to make it an infertility figurine. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and then we 3D scanned it. And so now I have that 3D model and, and uh, put it on a bicycle for, for, a, for a different project. Um, but there are, there are some heritage institutions, that, are, and I won't say who they are, um, that are very reluctant to make their 3D models available to anybody. Um, and there are other ones that are saying, yeah, put them out there. We want people to use the models. We want teachers to interact with the models. So if you're doing a program, say, on slavery, um, after tomorrow, hopefully, uh, you'll have a bunch of models from Montpelier and uh, um, um, uh, Manassas National Battlefield Park and Poplar Forest have all given permission for me to put their 3D scans up in a format that uh, anybody anywhere in the world could download if they want and print it nice. or, or manipulate some other way very cool do you see the uh issues of like who owns native culture with that being a recurring theme throughout archaeology but do you see those issues in the scanning end of this offering more opportunities for collaboration i think it, well unfortunately and as you know it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis um some groups are very sort of amenable to it other groups are not some aren't sure um, it's challenging. So I, I usually actually purposely avoid working on projects where I know there might be problems. Um, I uh, only scanned uh, a couple of uh, American Indian bones uh, um, that were provided to me by a museum um, that I have, you know, clear permission to do. But normally I sort of shy away from that kind of thing. Um, but uh, there definitely is is concern by some native groups about um, their material getting out there and they're not having control over it. And 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 that's just with the actual artifacts themselves, uh, much less a 3D scan. Okay. Well, I think we're going to take um, one last break here and then we'll come back and have you wrap up anything you want to say about 3D scanning that we haven't talked about. And maybe we'll do our app of the day segment as well. All right. Back in a minute. in CRM, a weekly podcast. Ask CRM professionals eight simple questions. The first questions establish education, location, and experience. The last questions are a reflection of that experience, and the answers will surprise you. Check out the show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash profiles. On that page, you can also request to be interviewed for the show. It only takes 20 minutes, and you don't need any special equipment. Let's get back to the show. All right, we're back. And before we get into our app of the day segment, Bernard, is there anything you think uh, should be mentioned about 3D printing and scanning that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I think that uh, people uh, should sort of keep up with um, what's available to them. Um, there's a website, I think I mentioned earlier, called Sketchfab. 
And Sketchfab is entering into a partnership with a lot of cultural heritage uh, institutions and giving them a free professional access to their website. So you have all the tools you need to uh, post high resolution models that people can manipulate and measure on the website. And then if you so choose, can make it printable. So the British Museum has objects on there. Uh, um, and in fact, uh, when I went to India, I stopped at the British Museum on the way and I 3D printed some of the stuff from their Egyptian collection and took it with me uh, into their Egyptian wing so I could see the original and the replica. Um, so that's certainly a, a good resource for people to look at. Uh, the Verge Creation Laboratory has created a page. We don't have any models on it yet. Uh, that's my uh, goal for tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> a lot of institutions are beginning to turn towards uh, Sketchfab for hosting their digital collections. Okay, awesome. All right, and we'll have links to some of the stuff that we've talked about here, like Sketchfab and some other things, up on the show notes page for this uh, episode. Just look for Archaeotech forward slash 19 for this episode. And now we're going to go into our app of the day segment. And between the three of us, we're going to talk about two applications, one of which I know I've used and uh, and one I haven't. So um, because I'm uber selfish, we'll talk about the one I have used first. So uh, Autodesk 123D Catch. And Autodesk is the, uh, um, you know, AutoCAD type people, that, that kind of stuff. Well, they've got this app that's free for iPhone and Android um, called 123D Catch. And basically, it's a, it's a photogrammetry application. And it, it'll give you this, this nice 360-degree um, uh, representation of where you need to take photos of something. Um, and it will it has all these little – it'll show you the, the different – tiles you've taken if you want to just take the front side of it and then you can get different angles and things like that and it kind of prompts you to take the right photographs um now you want to make sure your lighting is good and you're you know you're not moving closer and further away from the object because if you do stuff like that then the scan might not be as good your representation might not be as good the one thing this thing does do is as far as i know the last time i did use it is it's once you're finished it could take a little while to get the finished product back um because it sends it off to their servers processes it off-site, and then makes it available for you to manipulate. Um, and one thing I haven't done, Bernard, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, is I haven't used their desktop application for um, doing further manipulation to the scans. Have you used that? And, and if so, what kind of further functionality do you get? I have not actually used their uh, um, app. Um, I use the, uh, uh, on the desktop. I use their app, and I was not happy with one of the features of it. Um, and, and that feature that I was not happy with was the fact that it actually had to get processed by a third party right. server, uh, because some of the objects I deal with are culturally sensitive and I didn't like the idea of not having control over the object. For sure. For um, sure. Um, Autodesk does have a, uh, a higher, uh, end, uh, product that you can, you can purchase, or if you're, uh, happen to be an academic institution user for three years for free. Uh, that, that sort of works in, in uh, much the same way. Um, so, um, so I can't really speak to that. But, okay. Um, one, two, three D catch is is certainly fine, and if you're dealing with something you're uh, not worried about cultural sensitivity issues, I, I I recommend people use it, and it is free. Um, as a sort of related app, and I should have mentioned this earlier, um, Google Street View now has a three D scanning app that you can use. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, how, how does that so, work? But, but it's it's designed for scanning things like rooms um, or, or other larger things. So you basically stand in one place and you take pictures around you and it creates a 3D model that you can sort of move around it. I mean, this is this is Google. I assume they are processing those pieces of data on their servers. And is that added to Google Street View then? <laughs> uh, I think you have the option of adding it or not. Okay. Actually. Okay. Yeah. That's generous of them. Um, yeah, I haven't used it because uh, um, I can't find uh, uh, Street View on my tablet. Uh, my tablet says Street View is on it, but um, huh. it doesn't show up when I go into Maps. So I, I definitely have some software issues with my tablet. Uh, yeah, it seems to work well, fine on my Android. It seems to work fine on an iPad, Bernard. I don't know what to tell you. Well, and I have an <laughs> iPad as well. Like, uh, so. Nice, uh, nice. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about MeshLab real quick. Um, Chris, you want to bring up MeshLab? Yeah, Bernard, uh, again, you can fill in anything that you have that uh, I'm missing here. I just downloaded this last night, so I haven't had a chance to really uh, play with it that much. But with the sample scans they have, I see that they've got uh, different textures and then different visualizations. So like 
the sample I'm looking at right now is the brain. And one thing I noticed that's kind of cool is the point cloud that it offers for all the scans. Now, the question I have is, uh, what kind of a scale can we work with with this? Like, can you take a LiDAR point cloud and then visualize an entire landscape? Uh, you can, and people do that, actually. Cool. So, nice. Um, you'd have to probably simplify it if you're going to run it off a, a phone or a tablet. Uh, but if you're doing it on a computer, I mean, all, all of these 3D scans are point clouds, um, right? Uh, ultimate. Um, so, so you can you can actually um, um, was like the Autodesk, uh, the more uh, the non-free version software. Um, you can actually integrate different point clouds together, and you can even sort of geo-reference uh, your object into that point cloud. So, if you have a if you want to add an object that you found at a site. Uh, to a particular location, you could do that. Very cool. Now, um, one thing that I haven't discovered yet is uh, it's not very intuitive in this app. How do you import files into this thing? It is not very intuitive. Uh, that's the problem. MeshLab is an extremely powerful program, but it's it's not particularly intuitive. Um, what you would need to do is you probably need to uh, um, upload um, the models onto your um uh, tablet and then uh, um, link them to open with MeshLab. So if you click on the oh. model, it'll open MeshLab. Yeah. Okay. Oh, like email it to yourself or open it in Dropbox or something like that? Yeah. And then do an open in for MeshLab. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Bernard, do you have anything else to uh, say about any apps or anything uh, for the app of the day segment or, or anything about 3D scanning, really? This is your last chance. Uh, if, you, if you get into working with 3D models, um, um, and there's, uh, so I mentioned Sketchfab as one source. The Smithsonian has some stuff on their website. Uh, there's a website called Thingiverse. It's like universe, but with the word thing. Yeah, I've seen that. It's um, pretty cool. That had some archaeology stuff on it as well. But there's a program called Mesh Mixer, which is also Autodesk that's free. And it has very powerful tools for manipulating and, and, and cutting up models and, and uh, um, doing things like making half gorilla, half octopuses, uh, you know, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. So, um, um, so I would I would recommend that as as a program, um, and then on your desktop, it, you can use that for actually sort of uh, manipulating models and even getting some basic measurements on a model. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Um, if you go to the SHAs or the SAAs, um, hit up Bernard. He's usually there, uh, walking around. Um, so it's it's got some pretty cool stuff. Uh, are you going to the SHAs again this year? I am going to the SHAs and the SAAs. Nice, nice, awesome. And I will have I will have three D printed stuff with me. Awesome. Well, you had at the SAH last year in the tech room, you had the uh, a massive table full of all kinds of stuff. Are you doing that again this year? Um, I haven't heard from anybody at the tech room yet. So yeah, we'll I haven't either. Wait for the last minute. Um, yeah. I think they changed leadership. Okay. Um. So. Um. So yeah, if if they ask me, I will do it. Nice, nice. Yeah, if he's there and you're there, uh, check it out because they got some pretty cool stuff. I have a lot of different things now. Nice. I'm sure you. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Your Instagram. Soon we'll have the world hold his hand. Yeah, your Instagram 3D selfies or whatever you call them are uh, are getting a little crowded. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I, I've had to take some stuff out of my bag. It's start actually starting to get kind of heavy. So. Nice, nice. <laughs> Awesome. All right, Bernard. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll talk to you again some other time when we talk more about 3D scanning. If you got anything, any new things on the horizon or anything like that, we'll bring you back on. Okay, great. Nice talking to y'all. Thank you. That's it for another episode of the Archaeotech Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeotech. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for this episode. You can also email us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag archaeotech or tag at archpodnet in your tweet. Please share the link to this show wherever you saw it. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. You can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way. Don't forget to go over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content. 
Also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to arcpodnet.com slash members for more info.